Right, here we go. Oh, before we start, let me... I want to look something up because we were fighting to get the pronunciation of this. The inventor of photography, YouTube. Here we go. This will tell us. Do you remember we were talking yeah, about... There was, um, two, there was a French guy and the English nip, guy. Nip, was it Nipis? Nip, 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 nip. It sounds like I'm speaking in reverse. Yeah. Ni, it's N-I-E-P-C-E. Isn't it? But who is the other so person who claims it? This is what is considered to be the very first photograph. This is what is called a heliograph. It was so, made- uh, just quickly. This is the Art of Photography YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay. Um, if anybody knows about the way to pronounce this guy's name, it's going to be Ted Forbes. Made by a French scientist named Nessifor Nieps uh, is uh, of a rooftop. What did he say? In what is called a heliograph. It was right. made by a French scientist named Nessifor Nieps is, a, <laughs> is what is considered to be the I very first photograph. Listen. This is what is called a heliograph. Yep. It was made by a French scientist named Nessifor Nieps. Is <laughs> Are you any clearer? No. I know, not nips, at all. Nips, nips. And I thought it wasn't even him. Nips, I thought it was nips. there was another guy, Torbert. The what? Yeah, the one down in Letchley. William H. F. Torbert. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nobody seems to know. No. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, there we go. When we get to that, one, what was his name again? Nips, nip, 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 nip. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. The Fuji Cast. Hello, welcome to the Fuji Cast. We are, by the way. Um, not supposed to be giving it episode numbers now. There was a new Apple dictate that went in um, about podcasts, about putting podcast numbers on the on the descriptions. So, uh, by the way, if, you, if you're listening, thinking, what, where's the episode numbers gone? One, two, three, four, five, and how? You can find out episode numbers within the podcast app, but we're not allowed to put them in titles anymore. Well, that, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Well, it's just the way it is. So, I'm holding up my hand with the number five. of episodes. Yeah. Right, there we go. If so, you can look through the podcast channel you can see now kevin doing the episode number visually wow <laughs> why do they make things so confusing well there we go talking of confusion today um we're going to be talking about iso and that comes off the um the back of an email we got um there's been a, it's a huge hoo-ha at the moment about um about ISO and whether it's a real thing. So we thought we'd, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd tackle that. In fact, we're not going to tackle it. But a special guest who's going to tackle it. Also, this week is kit week. So we're talking about kit. We're, we're delving into each other's uh, camera bags. And we're simply going to talk about the kit that we use, why we use it, how we use it, and why it's important to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've got some questions about that as well. Had a good week? A not too of, bad. Bit of a holiday weekend you had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, my wife and I's anniversary. Yeah. Uh, how it's, many years? Uh, nine or ten. Do you not know? It's either nine or ten. Do you not? No. We got married on St David's Day, so I always know it's first of March. Okay, what year? You don't know. Nine or ten years ago, something like that. I yeah. can't believe you don't know the year. <laughs> yeah, but Gemma doesn't keep track either, in fairness. So anyway, we did. We had a lovely time. We went to Bath yeah. and um, we uh, we went to have a meeting about the X Weddings Festival at the Hilton. Um, ah, it's going ahead. Possibly, because Ooh. the... Is this the first announcement? No. Oh. Because the event planner wasn't there. Oh. So okay. she was as unwell, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're the, the gears are grinding slowly for that again. Wow. Um, if it does happen, though, it will definitely not be in June. It will probably be more September. Yeah. I was going to say, it can't be June. No. We've only got months to go now. No. And so, yeah, we hung around. We were like a couple of students, me and Gemma. It was great. Yeah. The kids were at home with... Um, the kidlings. Some, some, the kidlings. Parent, some grandparent. And, uh, yeah, we just kind of went around the bar and Gemma did a bit of shopping and nice. we went for a nice meal we went to uh, Hudson Steakhouse which is a beautiful place never um, been really nice like really nice everybody said you've got to go to Hudson Steakhouse mm. and it's interesting actually because one of the, the chefs there um, as I was exiting kind of grabbed me he said oh you know, I've been listening to your uh, Fujicast podcast and you know like your YouTube stuff and everything so we had a little bit of a chat um, he cooked my dinner and, did you uh, get it for free? Uh, no, oh, no, okay. no. He did buy us a drink though, which was very kind of him. Uh, I had a glass of wine. Gemma had the most expensive thing she could find <laughs> on the menu. <laughs> Go, Gemma. <laughs> and, uh, Twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was good. Then, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. what else I do? Nothing really. Uh, well, that's enough. Yeah, that was it. It was good. So it we was came. Really nice. We came without the kids. We came without the kids. Getting recognised in restaurants. <laughs> I know you don't like that kind of thing. No. Um, got uh yeah and that was it and then sunday or was it saturday i can't even remember it was friday friday was the anniversary so we were mm. about friday mm. saturday i mostly spent lying down on the sofa 
Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the weather on Sunday was terrible. Was there it? only rugby over the weekend? I, no, I was away, so I didn't. It was one of those ridiculous break weeks that they have. They oh, shouldn't yeah. have break weeks in rugby. Well, they they need break weeks. No, they don't. They should just get on with it. Oh, footballers get break weeks. Yeah. I think rugby players should. No, go. no, no. I hate the break week. Six Nations. It's like you just get into it, and then yeah. suddenly they go, "No, it's not on anymore." And you, yeah. Like, uh, and now I can't watch the rest of the Six Nations because I'm You're doing weddings this weekend. <laughs> I'm actually no. I'm going to watch Cardiff versus West Ham. Uh, with Albi, I'm taking him to his first ever Premiership wow. football game. Fantastic! Yeah, uh, I'm sure it'll be dreadful. Is that at, in Cardiff? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll be supporting Cardiff as yeah. they get hammered by the hammers. By the hammers. Um, and then, yeah, the week after, which is the final weekend of the Six Nations, is I'm at the photography show doing some talks. Oh. I'm doing a talk during the actual. Two things happen in my You're life. You're not talking while the match is on, are you? Two two things are very important in my life. Yeah, rugby. Rugby, I know that. And Martin Parr. <laughs> no, at three in o'clock. In that order? Uh, um, yeah, vaguely. Uh, at three o'clock on Saturday, the 16th of March, is the final leg of the Six Nations yeah. kicking off. Yeah. Martin Parr is doing his talk on the super stage at the photography <laughs> show, and I'm doing my talk on the wedding stage at the photography show. So, so I can't do either of the two things that I want to do. Um, there all, you go. All conspiring. Yeah. All, all conspired. I've got Total. a Martin Parr uh, postcard in my glass cabinet over here. I must take that out. I'll show uh, you. Yeah. Signed. I know you. You probably know him personally. So, no, I don't actually. But uh, all I have met him. Nice guy. But um, so yeah. So I went to Bath and had an anniversary. Um, you went somewhere a bit further afield. Well, I was, yeah, much further afield. I was in the Gambia, finishing off um, the work that I've been doing out there on uh, on a documentary. I can't really talk about the. I'm going to make a film. I'm going to make a YouTube film. Um, about about the documentary, but not about the documentary. I, um, th- the the way things happen in Africa when you need to talk to um, particular people. So we're we're doing a story about um, a time in its rather turbulent uh, political history. Okay, now I know that sounds all very highbrow for me. Um, it, it it it's a it's a really interesting story, and um, so I'm going to make this film about uh, the most important interview that this whole film revolves around. So I arrive in the Gambia, and um, the interview is not really set up. It's quite a long way to go on a, a kind of a <laughs> not really set up precedent, and so I'm going to make this film about uh, about getting this interview, which this whole documentary, I've got to go back and film more, hmm. is based around. If I hadn't got this interview, it would be a pointless waste of time. And I, we, there, there was a kind of, well, it's on, yeah, you can come along. And then there was a, no, maybe not, no, we don't think it's the right time. Then there was another moment of, yep, yep, it's definitely on. Yeah. And then the next day, nope, nope, we're not doing it. And so... Um, yeah, so I'm going to make a film about 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 chasing an interview in Africa. Yeah, I know it's not the same thing, but it sounds very similar to the to life in southern Spain during the summer. Yeah, very much a manana attitude, perhaps. But are we allowed to mention the gun? Uh, yeah, I guess you can. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, you better tell us because you were the one with the gun waved around in front of you. Yeah, I'm not used to that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Funny to be enough. fair, somebody waving a gun at me. Yeah, you yeah. Use let me it. save that for the film. Okay. Yeah. Right. We won't talk about the gun. Do you know? Two years ago, um, there was a guy in charge called Jamé, and it was a bit a bit like Lord Voldemort. You would not have been able to say this guy's name uh, for fear of being locked up in the infamous uh, Mile Two prison. Mm. Uh, which I think is called Mile 2 because it's two miles out of the, the city of Banjul. I, that's what I think it is. And um, so, yeah, two years ago, it, it was a very... There were places of the Gambia that, that you would not have been going to as a tourist. And you certainly would not have been... You would not have been able to get in, involved in political debate. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, we... Um, we we've been making this 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 documentary that covers a political part. We couldn't have done that two years ago. No, things have changed an awful lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we did um, we picked up one guy who's playing the part of a, an SAS soldier in this documentary reconstruction we had to do. So this this bit I can tell you. Right. Now we'd bought some um, some plastic shotguns from um, a supermarket. <laughs> I know you're looking at me thinking, what are you doing? <laughs> so yeah, I got some I got some chocolate, um, some ham, some cheese for the sandwiches, and two plastic shotguns. And we left them in the toy covering because we knew we were gonna make this journey. Um th- th- there's about an hour's journey we needed to make out in the countryside to do this. Now, um they do have police checks on the roads. And um we we obviously thought, well, if we get stopped, we're gonna have to explain these away. 
but that's okay because they're still in the they're still in the box and it's fine. What we weren't considering was one of the actors had a real um, shotgun <laughs> that he brought with him, <laughs> and and he um, he decided to tell us between two of the police stops, uh. and uh, and then we spent. I think we went through six police stops that day and fortunately weren't stopped because if they'd have checked through the bags, yeah. we might have ended up in mile two uh, trying to explain uh, away a shotgun with a couple of clips of yeah. live, ammuni- uh, live ammunition. I imagine that. I'd have to find somebody else to do the podcast with. He would have Terrible. done. I'd still be there. Mm. Anyway, so it's an interesting week. And, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll do that uh, that YouTube <laughs> film. So this week is Kit Week. And uh, we're going to be talking about um, our, our bags. And also I thought it would be a nice opportunity to hear from the man behind the shot kit. Yeah. More about that in a moment. Do you want to launch off with a with a question, though? I will, indeed. A very quick question from uh, Mary. Bear in mind, we've had hundreds of questions, haven't we? Yeah, had hundreds really and good. hundreds yeah. of questions. It's been really good. Um, so I'm going to pick one from uh, Marius Peter. And he didn't actually leave anything in the in the content. It just said in the subject, 50 F2 or 56 okay. 1.2 for yeah, weddings? Yeah. Question mark. Um, very simple answer for me is 56 1.2. More versatility, better uh, light gathering. Uh, however, it's bigger, slower, not weather sealed and more expensive. Um, so your mileage may vary. But for yeah. me, I have the 56 1.2. Yep, same for me. I do have the 50 um, F2. You have the 50 F2, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I have it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started out using it a lot, thinking, "What, what, a, what an interesting um, focal length!" Because it's effectively seventy-seven millimeters, mm-hmm. isn't it? Something like that. So it, it neither fits into that fifty thing of being just a little bit too close, and, and sometimes the eighty-five. I'm talking about um, yeah. um, in a full traditional frame, thirty-five yeah, yeah, millimeter yeah. full frame talk, um, and, and it d- doesn't fit into either of those. It's somewhere in between, which I thought was really, really handy. But uh, I've gone back to using the the fifty-six now. Okay, your turn. Okay, if uh, hi, Kev. Um, hi Neil. If memory serves, oh, this isn't really one about. Um, this isn't. Uh, this isn't really one about the kit. Um, it's just covering some ground. Both. Uh, oh, here we go. Nip, nip, nip is nip. The guy that we would. Nip, 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 I need to. Yeah, we need to. And William H. F. Torber evolved their processes simultaneously. Oh, this this is all about who Ah, invented the camera. All right, okay. So we need to know. Torber was slower in publicising his though, Ah. which resulted in him being accused in some quarters of plagiarism, and being some kind of imposter, fake. Oh, fake! Imagine if Facebook was around then. Yeah, cripes. I think what is more relevant is that Torber gave us the first means of a, a reproducible image, which made him really the founder of photography, not the French. Frenchman. Okay. There we go. So he was the founder, but the Frenchman took the first picture. Uh, the Frenchman took all the credit for it. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, anyway, I'm sure you might have more qualified listeners to comment, but I thought I'd put that one in there for you. That's from Paul Henderson. So thank you, Paul. That solved that problem. It wasn't really a kit piece. Go on, you, you go with it. Yeah. Okay. The so piece. I have another one. Uh, this is from Matt. Uh, Matt Chan yeah Matthew Chan uh, hi Neil and Kevin great that you're making the podcast blah 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 blah, blah etc etc um, thank you by the way after watching a vlog that Neil made of his family holiday with the X-T3 it has inspired me to try and make some home movies with a higher quality camera setup mm. I would like I've currently got the X100 by the way I would like to shoot run and gun and so won't be using a gimbal would you guys recommend going for an X-T2 or 3 with 18 to 55 kit um or an XH1 due to the IBIS. So I, I'll, I'll 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 chip in, and then you can chip in because you you know you you, you do a lot more filming than I do. But for me personally, um, I really me and the XH1 uh, just I didn't didn't I just didn't like it. Frankly, I didn't I didn't like the camera. Um, not that it was a bad camera, but it didn't suit my purposes. It was bigger and heavier, and I had no need for IBIS in that sense. Um, for the people that wanted a bigger mirrorless camera that with ibis then it worked for them so i haven't really got experience with the xh1 to talk about in that respect um what i will say though is the it depends a little bit on budget um but something like the xt3 with the ois lenses are very very good um and so it's the image stabilized um lenses image stabilized lenses yeah. yeah i think that's that's a necessity of course yeah um no so the 1855 which i think is uh, ois 1024 is ois uh the the other one the um 
I'm trying to think because I, I really only use the 1024 image stabilized uh, for when I'm making my films. There's the six, is it a 16 to something or other? Is that image stabilized? I, do I you sound like I know this. what I'm on about? Yeah. Probably not. Um, anyway, but I I do um, all of my kind of video and filming and stuff that I'm doing with the X-T3 with the OIS lenses for right. sure. Definitely very important. Um, or just stabilize it. You know, I know a gimbal isn't necessarily the right thing, but, you know, you can get small tripods and all that kind of stuff that are pretty good. And even, believe it or not, the X-T100, which is really cheap, um, is very good. Again, with an OIS lens, uh, very, very good for kind of running and gunning, vlogging, etc. It's not the same quality. It it depends on your your production level, what you need it for. Um, But really, if you're looking to, you know, to get something decent Mm. at a reasonable price, then uh, X-T100 is potentially good to look at. And of course, you know, I keep forgetting because it only happened last week or so, the X-T30 is now out. Which is, for all intents and purposes, exactly the same as the X-T3 inside the box with the caveat for filming that you um, you can only record for 10 minutes. Um, I think it has some other minor kind of deficiencies compared to the X-T3 in terms of filming. Uh, it's not weather sealed, all that, blah, 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 but smaller, lighter, cheaper. Um, so <laughs> my, my, my take on it is that there is lots of options out there. Um, I don't necessarily think the X-H1 is... is you know, always the right answer. Well, I'm going to give you a, an example of having worked in the Gambia last week uh, on this film. Um, now, I, I put the camera on uh, on sticks for when we did some um, some interviews. But apart from that, the producer and the director who's working on this this particular program said um, he wants it all handheld. Um, so all the reconstructions and some of the stuff around the towns and the villages. Handheld. So I put it, Manfrotto do this, um, so it looks like a steering wheel. And in the middle of the steering wheel, you can, you can yeah, know bolt yeah. your, yeah. So mm-hmm. that gives you quite, you, you've got quite a good, um, you know, you've got quite a good grip on mm-hmm. the camera. So you can hold it reasonably steady. Mm. Um, but this idea of everything having to be so steady, no movement at all, completely image stabilised, mm. is so far from what people on Netflix and the, mm. the producer, you see some of the stuff that's produced. Oh, I know. With, with uh, handheld shaky yeah, footage, yeah, yeah, yeah. which gives. And th- this particular producer said to me, "Look, it's. I, I don't want anything that's silky smooth. I mm. want it to feel like there's some energy in it." And, Blair Witch. Yeah, hey, yeah. So I used to be after this just completely stable look but i'm no longer after that i uh, we watch in our house we watch a lot and i mean a lot of modern family you see that on the netflix no it might be on amazon prime no I've not modern family it. no. family it's no. it's a very funny american comedy um but anyway I'm, <laughs> it's very funny and uh and that's all hands held for, it's it it's like for me when i watch it it's almost like you, the, the camera crew are stumbling into a scene. They almost, you know, they kind of stumble from one room to the next and it's like they've almost been taken by surprise. And so they kind of slow and hold the film in and it's it's handheld and it's very much, uh, you know, aimed at making you feel like you're in that room with them rather mm. than it being a full production, you know, and, you know, kind of stuff. Uh, it's very good. Um, but, yeah, I totally agree. And But Blair Witch was the first thing that came to my mind yeah. in terms of remembering that kind of thing. So I think we're both saying here, go for the camera you think's better, not not the image stabilisation. Yeah. Go for the one that feels better in your hand. For me, the X-T3, because of the, the advances of late with the, the, the sensor, mm. um, the fact that um, oh, I love, you know, the, the quality coming out of this camera is amazing. 200 X-T3. megabits a second. Yeah. 4K recordings. 60p. Yeah, it's incredible. quality is incredible. And actually, the X-T3 has just had a firmware update, or they've announced it. Oh, no, it's out. Yeah, it's definitely out. With the mm-hmm. um, So now they've got the uh, log gamma um, profiling, um, which gives it an incredible dynamic range. Uh, okay. Incredible dynamic range in the log Did that files. happen in the last week? No, it happened probably about three or four weeks ago. Oh, okay. There's another firmware update coming very soon, which is going to incre- in, make the face recognition much Even quicker. Better. And good. Well, that, that's a like good that. thing. I've got one here. Hi, chaps. I'm about to receive... This is from Marcus Cohen. I'm about to receive my X-T3. I've started looking at third-party batteries as I've used them successfully in my X-100s or, or in my X-100S, I'm sure he means. What are your thoughts on third-party batteries? Dun, dun, dun. Do you want to go first? <laughs> um, yeah, I can do. Well, uh, you know, the fact is I've got hundreds of 
third party batteries and they've all been very good and never had any issues with them whatsoever um the f- the truth is with the xt3 with the heat um sink and uh, the extra capacity that's inside that camera fujifilm have made a conscious decision to encourage us to use the specific uh sexually named mp 126s batteries yeah, i think they're called the new one, yeah. um and if you don't use them and you're doing say filming or you're trying to shoot in very high but um shutter speed it will come up on the screen and say hey you know what you, you probably need to think about this um which won't actually stop you using those batteries. No, it doesn't. But will no. be more than uh, it will just be an annoyance more than anything. But on the flip side, I do think I don't think they would do something like that unless there was a reason for it. It's not. It's you know. It, it's not. They don't. They're not just doing it to make you buy Fujifilm batteries. They're doing it for a reason. And you know, we've all seen experience and experienced in the past, both with Fujifilm and other cameras, where you know the, the you know for overheating system uh, problems yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So, for the XT3, I would actually say that it's best to use original Fujifilm 126s batteries. Um, okay. I think that's probably the wisest choice. I've got... Uh, let me grab... They're oh. a bit expensive, though. How much? Oh, I don't know. There's like something like £45 a battery. All right, I've got my... This is my battery bag. I have a pencil case with two sides. One for spent, one for... It says charged. Look. Charged. Charged. So uh, on, on one the other side, side, and the other one's just across. Uh, yeah, but you know what my... Ba- <laughs> what does yours say? <laughs> I have two pockets in my camera bag. One says good, one says bad. <laughs> Oh, well, mine's That's got my batteries go. charged and crossed. <laughs> so I charged them all up last night, and um, I've got a real mixture. So that a lot of red dots in here, which are suggestive of the, the new battery. Why didn't you just put a tick instead of the word charge? This is intriguing me. You've got a cross for not charged, yeah. and then the whole word charged. Well, it's a very good point. There's no reason why not. Waste of ink, that. That was a waste <laughs> of ink. But I, I bought a whole pile of these. These are the um, the X-Pro EX-PROs. Yeah, they're the ones I have, yeah. And uh, I found these great with the XT3, by the way. Yeah, they will work. Yeah, but I don't, I don't get the warning message either. No, uh, yeah, you won't get the warning message for everything. No. It's only certain things. I, I do when I happen. use the, the old square, um, uh, the square red. Oh, there, there's one. Oh, so the one, MP126, not MP126, S. MP126, yeah. Okay, so maybe the message only comes up when it, it can tell the difference between the old Fujifilm batch and the new ones, but not third-party ones. I'll put that one mm, back there. That's interesting. There we go. Right, okay, hopefully that answers your question on that. Um, let's go for something a little different now. Um, I'm going to, uh, yeah. This is a this is this is an intriguing one. The Fuji cast. This one comes in from Chris Chris McSherry, who I think is coming on a course with you, isn't he? he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't Chris, he? yeah. Name rings a bell. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. He could have got this question in at your course, apart from the fact that I've got an expert on this one. Um, the question was: I don't know if you've seen a recent camera-related YouTube channel video on ISO, but it raises the Fuji film is cheating on its ISO numbers. Actually, to be fair, I think the original one wasn't really about Fuji film. It was about it, it's about the, the the ISO debate in general with all with all makes. Curious to think what you guys believe. Or if you can offer some clarification. I know there are a few standards for cameras, ISO, etc., etc. So why is it called cheating if Fujifilm is using just one of the standards? I think Olympus uses the same standard as Fujifilm does, and, and so on and so forth. Anyway, I thought the best person to talk about this would be um, <laughs> probably not me. Um, and um, there, there's a guy called Dave McKeegan who I saw do a follow-up film to the one that Tony Northrup did, mm-hmm. uh, about, which I think is what started the whole debate. So, hi, Dave, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Your video, by the way, was fantastic, because it talked in normal language, and I understood it, I think. Um, but it was really... Was it a rebuff of the Tony Northrup one? Uh, or Because it, it felt like that. You, there were some positive bits of Tony's video, weren't there? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm... I'm I, I, I didn't go out to say that Tony was completely wrong about everything. It was just that I think the picture, that the impression that he painted overall, I think was slightly inaccurate, um, and, and particularly kind of 
uh, newer photographers might get the wrong impression from what he was saying so i wanted to try and clarify that so can we let's go right back to the start the the video that tony brought out was suggesting that iso is not the barometer for for how your camera deals with light and the the um, the availability of it is that correct yeah so he was suggesting that um the the iso is obviously no longer like film where you change the film sensitivity but you're just artificially amplifying the signal in camera and you could do exactly the same thing just on your computer if you wanted to and that's right and he did some examples didn't he Yes. So how did those examples work? So he took a test shot at, uh, at a high ISO and got a, a correct exposure. And then he then basically just turned down the ISO and took another test shot that was extremely underexposed. And then when he brought the exposure back for that in Lightroom, he, he kind of got two very similar looking images. But the reality was far from that, wasn't it? Well, the reality in that for, is open to interpretation you know kind of noise is a very much a matter of opinion and i've had some people um, come back and say they could see a lot of difference between the two images that he's shown and some people say they couldn't see a difference at all um but i found if you do your own tests on that depending on camera to camera you know the differences can be extremely noticeable and sometimes the differences just aren't there at all uh, he suggested that the best idea would be to do away with iso and just have this thing called gain which is the way that that uh, it works in video world uh yeah that was that was a suggestion that he he put forward he's saying that well he, i think he was saying that basically iso just is gain so it wouldn't actually change anything apart from the name so just take us through your findings then dave what you found the kind of tests you did and whether iso is really important or not well i've in fact just actually last night i put another follow-up video from that video where i went a lot more in depth into to what's actually going on and it's something that i found is extremely camera dependent so there is not just one you know kind of one statement that i could say that covers every single camera on the market however there are some cameras that that you know that you see a noticeable difference in the results that you get so the test that I was doing was pretty much the same sort of test that Tony did. So I, I set a, a test scene up under artificial light. I adapted a, a lens to five different cameras, um, which were two Sony cameras and three Canon ones. And I set the, the, set the exposure up so that at ISO 6400, the scene was correctly exposed. And I then took a, a shot at every full stop under that so i just dropped the iso i didn't change any of the other settings i just dropped the iso down so that by iso 100 you basically just got like a very black image and i then took them all into lightroom and i corrected the exposures for every single one so that they were all then back to correct exposure um, in post and then you can see if there's a difference between shooting at high isos and shooting at low isos and, and fixing afterwards and what I found is that all the Canon cameras that I tested, you can see a very noticeable difference between post-process fixing and in-camera fixing with the ISO. Mm -hmm. With the Sony, because it's ISO invariant or close to ISO invariant, there's not really that much of a difference. So it really depends on the camera that you've got. That makes sense. That part of it makes sense <laughs> <laughs> to me. <laughs> Why does it make so much difference to people, Dave? Um I suppose everyone's just got their own, you know, their own way of doing things. And I suppose the, the, the thing with photography is there's, so there's no right or wrong way of doing things. There's obviously just the ways that suit you and the way that, you know, whatever suits your flow. And since the last video that I put up where I went more in-depth into it, I've had a couple of people commenting saying that they, their style of shooting is always to just go very underexposed and bring it back later because they were under some impression that the the computer can do a better job of recovering information because it's a big processing unit rather than the camera because it's only a small processor so i don't know i think everyone's got their own impressions as to how cameras actually work so dave i didn't see the original um tony northrop video um okay i actually like i like a lot of the stuff he puts out there but i didn't see that one and um so forgive me if the, the way because i am very simple and so i you know i have a simplistic brain so yep. i see the three values of exposure iso shutter speed uh, aperture 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, in my mind, you know, if you if you have less light coming in because of two of the parameters, then, you know, you need to put push the ISO up or the ISO, as we're now told. Yeah. We have to say ISO rather than ISO. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's a, that's a kind of logical thing in my mind. So when I'm shooting, I'm thinking, right, OK, I have to bring my shutter speed down. I'm going to push the ISO up, uh, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Now, this idea of using, I don't know, something like gain or taking or taking away that element of the calculation is that's the bit that I get confused with. You know, what what is, you know, you know, in Tony's mind, perhaps, is it is he thinking you just have some kind of dial on the side that you rotate up and down for brighter pictures? I don't know. You know, is it like exposure compensation? It, it just in my mind, I just can't figure it out. And I'm no, essentially, the gain, the gain idea that Tony's putting forward is no different than how ISO currently works in essence. It's mm. just when you change your ISO in your camera, you're not kind of all you're all you're essentially doing is just artificially amplifying the signal that the camera is generating. Right. So at, the, at your at your native base ISO that your camera produces, mm -hmm. the signal doesn't get changed at all. That's just, you know, yeah. however much light that the camera captures, yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. As you then increase the ISO, the camera is just amplifying that signal. Yep. But obviously, it then any background interference that mm -hmm. is, is being generated within the camera also gets amplified, and mm -hmm. that's what you see as noise in the image. Right. So the notion that Tony's coming up with, I think, it's, I think Tony's point is more just that he's saying that ISO used to be this standard with film where you would have different sensitivities but because we're not physically having a, a different sensitivity to the sensor anymore right. it's not really how iso used to be and he's saying it should just be called gain instead i don't think he's suggesting that it should change okay. how it works i think he's just saying it should be labeled differently so it's more of a nomenclature um yeah. thing rather yeah. than, than a technical thing right okay that makes more sense i'm not i'm less panicky now <laughs> <laughs> dave the the videos are great um, I think you should promote your video, your YouTube channel. So how do we find you? Uh, just search my name, Dave McKeegan, and you should, uh, as far as I know, I'm the only person on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are the only Dave McKeegan, that's true. <laughs> Dave, thanks very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Cheers, Not Dave. a problem. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, so in a moment, we've got the shot kit interview, I that's think. Yep. And then if you guys, uh, once you've got through that, we've got an amazing little competition from our friends at QT Albums. Yes. Um, We're starting something new. We're going to be doing more competitions. Yeah, and we've got something to give away to one of you guys. Um, so, yeah, hang around for that. And uh, we've got uh, – we're still doing kit, so I think we've got another question. Another question. Ben Searson. Um, I have a question for you. It was more than, more than one question. There's been a lot of questions here. Zoom lenses, cheap versus the expensive and somewhere in between. I went to the Le Mans uh, 24 hour 2016 with an XE2 and an XC50 to 230. 100 quid second hand. Is that good value? Brilliant. All right. Once I got uh, the hand uh, hang of panning, I got some pretty good results. Last year, I took the XT1 and borrowed a 50 to 140, which you have, mm -hmm. uh, with a 1.4 converter. I must admit, I didn't get on with a pair of them somehow. I actually felt I'd done better the first time with the cheaper gear. Looking back at the photos, they're pretty good, but I'm not sure whether I'd do it again. Um, your thoughts, really, on the the 50 to 230 or or you know the zoom lens. Your thoughts on the zoom lenses? Okay, so uh, the XC lenses are the the cheaper kind of plasticky lenses, mm -hmm. um, and they're the ones I, I can usually tell them because they come with white end caps, little plastic white end caps, and come okay. with proper black ones. Um, but they are the the kind of much cheaper lenses. Um, I have a couple because I've had to buy kit kit um, cameras in the past and they've come with the lenses i have to say i don't really use them much um but that said i think fujifilm are known especially now for the the quality of their kit lenses i mean back in the day when uh when i shot canon the, the kit lenses that came in the boxes weren't you know you, you, uh, i don't know whether it's true but i Personally, in my mind, I always used to think, "Well, I'm going to have to upgrade to an L lens," you know. Um, but the XE lenses seem to be seem to be good enough. And, and the fact is, you know, you you were using an XE2, I think he said first yep, time round, yep. uh, with the XE lens, and then went to an XT1. So, if my brain is in the right 
capacity. That's the same sensor. XT2, XT1 had the same x trans sensor, I think. Um, so the same stuff was kind of going on inside the camera. Different form factor may have helped with the, the pan in. I personally prefer the XE form factor over the XT form factor. And then, of course, if you're sticking a big 50, a 50 to 270 lens or well, 50 to 160, whatever it was, um, and a converter, then that is definitely going to introduce more stability issues and more issues in terms of, you know, kind of getting those panned images. And we're just looking at your website now, Ben, actually, and yeah. you know, well, he, he, pictures. He yeah. did some notes. So if you if you, um, if you you go to the show notes, we're going to be much better now at putting the show notes within the pod, the actual podcast app as yeah, well. but we're not going to tell you what <clears throat> episode we're on because that's illegal. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But photography forward slash motorsport, the link will be there. Uh, you'll be able to see um, some images that I'm just about to mention. If you look at the link, the top section down to the black and red 38 car were done on the 50 to 140, the blue 28, the black and white 68 car below were on the 50 to 230. The last image on the page, which will be the black and white one at the bottom, I guess, on the 35 1.4 of 5000 ISO. Nice. Um, there's some great images yeah, on here. Yeah, you go yeah. go to Ben's website and um, yeah, and you'll and you'll see those. Yeah, very cool. So uh, it's kit week, and we're going to come back in a moment and talk about our individual bags and what we use and why we use them. Okay, and we'll address that question in a moment. First of all, I want to break away for um, it's a, it's another trip down under. This one I recorded with Mark Condon, who is the founder of Shot Kit. Yep. You've appeared on Shot Kit a long uh, time ago. I was on there a long time ago. You were ago. one of the founder Shot Kit mentions. Uh, I was probably. very proud of my... Founding. I was very proud of my picture that I sent him because he said... You did I, a smiley face I one, did a smiley, did a smiley, smiley, yeah. smiley face. Should, should explain cameras. that. Should explain yeah. what you mean by this. So everybody lays their kit out. Yeah. And how did you do yours? I made mine into a smiley face, yeah. So I had all the batteries with teeth, uh, <laughs> black and white teeth. <laughs> And I had some lenses as eyes. Some yeah. I used camera straps as hair. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was really proud of it. And in fact, I think if I remember rightly, he's just done a post on his website on the Shotkit website about his favourite posts. And mine, Are you one of them. Mine fell in the uh, mine fell in the the creative use of camera setup, I think, or something like that. Yeah, because he's quite specific about uh, you. You can't go too far left field. Although I've started to see some left field layouts, but in essence, Shotkit Shotkit dot com is all about kit used by photographers. And you know, for a lot of people who like rubbing their rubbing their trousers under the desk a little bit too much when you start looking at other people's kit, this is the perfect place for you to be. Mm. Um, and um, and I, I met up with uh, with Mark recently. This is the, the interview that we recorded while we were walking across a bridge at Darling Harbour. I did not go to Australia just to record an interview with Mark. I could have done that via Skype. But the fact that I, I happen to be um, in the country where he now lives... Um, this was a, a great opportunity. So this is that interview. So Shot Kit was uh, it's, it's around 2014, early 2014, and I decided to make a. I was just curious, whenever I read a magazine, there'd always be like a flat lay of products. Like this is what you need to be taking on holiday. It's essentially what they want to try and sell you. But they're always really neatly laid out images of gadgets. Yeah. And there's something about that that I really liked, just the editorial aspect of it, and also. Um, I don't know, just seeing what people are supposed to have or what's useful for the average guy, whatever it was. And then so I thought, oh, I want to make a website about that, not for photographers, but for just anything. And I think so I So initially it wasn't going to be just photography? No, I think I got a domain name like inside my bag or something and I thought um, it, this could be applied to, you know, school kids with their school bags, tennis players, fishermen, just anyone who has yeah. a bag that's got something useful. God, a fishing version would be huge. Yeah. Well, this, that's the thing. Hang so on, let I, me go and register that name. Yeah. Fish bag. Fish bag. <laughs> Tackle bag. Tackle, Tackle bag. Bags. Anyway, I messed around with that and it didn't work and it was too big the project. There was too many elements involved and then I just forgot about it for a few months. And then I came back to it and I was so stupid. It didn't even occur to me that I should be focusing on just one niche that I'm interested in. And I think my wife was just like, yeah, why don't you just do photography? And I, hey, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, the more I thought about it, it was like, well, yeah, that's exactly what I did. As soon as I decided oh, I want to do wedding photography, I, it was Jonas Peterson's work I came across first. Around that time, um, 
he was uh, sort of all over wedding photography because he just won some awards. Yeah. He just had a bit of a different kind of style in those days, I guess. Because I didn't had no idea about camera gear, then the first step is, okay, well, I need the gear that this guy's using to shoot the photo. That's, you know, I want to cook a nice meal. I need the same <laughs> frying pan as that chef. Yeah. <laughs> Makes no sense, but yeah, that's how the idea came about. Well, I want to look at other people's camera bags. Maybe someone else does as well. Was it difficult to, to get people on board to, to understand what you were trying to achieve? Uh, I, before that I was working in online marketing um, as a copywriter and I worked with like graphic designers and I was in that kind of space so maybe it was because of that but I kind of felt that if I didn't have something concrete-ish to show the photographers that look good um, then it will be very hard for them to prove to them you know it's worth spending two hours of your day putting this together for Absolutely. me. So yeah, I, I mocked up like uh, how their page would look. I'd put their name in the, you know, big on there and um, just made it look pretty close to what it looks today, just one page. And I'm like, this is what it's gonna look like. And then, yeah, I just blanket emailed maybe 200 photographers. Um, and then when people started replying, I'd send me a message out saying, oh, you know, Jonas is on board or blah, blah, blah. Ironically, Jonas said yes. This was back in 2014. I think he said yes every year and then now he just doesn't reply and he's never actually been on the site. <laughs> it's, it's kind of turned on its head now, isn't it? Because I would imagine like any good idea when it's really, when it really takes root and, and people then understand what you're trying to achieve with it, then they want you. Yeah, I like to think that ShotKit's kind of known in a, in a certain yeah, in the photography world. Um, not as much as I would like it to be. Um, yeah, without sounding big-headed, I do think it's a really useful resource in terms of not just looking at gear, but just seeing how other photographers feel about the gear that they're using as well. Have you noticed kits changed? That mirrorless has become more prevalent or any particular brand is favored? Um, yeah, it's a slow transition to mirrorless. I'd say start of this year I've been receiving uh, yeah more. So there's 20, 23 categories now so I've noticed that's one thing that has grown. Yeah I'd love that to be unlimited like just if someone sends me a you know if they're a professional bridge photographer I'll make a new category. Are there any uh, scalps I'm gonna call them scalps I'm not sure it's the right word or not that you're particularly proud to have on there? Um, I, th I had an interview with Albert Watson and yeah, this my ignorance, I didn't actually, I hadn't heard of him before, uh, a week before I had the interview. Like I, I came across his work and I, I reached out and then I was surprised that the, his secretary was all over it and he was like, yeah, what do you want from him? And I reached out for the, just a, a shot kit feature, like talk about his gear. And then I realized that's a bit short-sighted. You know, there's so much more you could talk about. Yeah, and we had a phone interview and he was lovely and that's actually buried on the site. I need to revive it because it's, it's uh, evergreen, like it's as relevant now and it's really, yeah, it was great insight. He talked about the Jagger photo, yeah. the uh, jobs, everything. It's a great way to find uh, photographers' work that you may not have found otherwise. I'll, I'll give you an example, Nicky Boone. Right. So Nicky's work is superb. The, uh, but I, I dare, yes, I, yeah. yeah, from yeah. New Zealand. I dare say that there are lots of photographers that will never have heard of Nicky Boone, whose work is just, Amazing. So in, in terms of resource, it's, it's great for that shot kit, right. isn't it? I'd say the first two years I wanted to get like famous photographers on there and I thought, oh, people want to see yeah. what X, Y, Z, who's, what he's using. Um, but then after that, I was kind of, there's so many photographers that people had never heard of and probably never will. And I wanted to get those people on the site. When you look at the site and you look at the, and we'll come to the resources section in a minute, because that's, I think, as relevant now as just looking at people's kit. But sticking with the kit for a second there seems to be a format lay them out on the floor there's a lot of wooden floorboards a lot of melamine on there <laughs> but i noticed some people uh d2 photography put a table tennis yeah. table in there and jeff newsom <laughs> jeff, jeff newsom's one looks like a, mur I took that photo. a murder scene did you yeah, take that photo? A story short story about oh, that one. tell me about that one then so jeff i've been clamoring to get he's yeah yeah and i went to his uh workshop he had one in sydney and that was my game to go to his workshop meet him in person and then 
seduce him to be on my site and he's a lovely guy and he's the kind of person that you could email him 10 times and he'd ignore every single one of them yeah. but then he'd be first to come up to you and say hello to you in a bar yeah he's a lovely guy and i ended up giving him a lift down to meet his wife and i was like hey let's do this thing you're never going to have time to do it on your own yeah. you've all ignored all my emails and he's <laughs> laughing and he's like yeah i don't i don't reply and then he's like yeah what do you want me to do and i'm like well, yeah, just pretend it's a murder scene or something and we just, yeah, he's just laid on the floor, threw his stuff out and then I did like a little video interview of him. But, but is there a, a format then that, yeah. that you prefer people to stick to? It's got to be a fairly simple backdrop. You don't want people being too complex. Exactly, yeah. That was one thing that I've kept the whole way through and it's a very regimented, format. yeah. If people send me their gear shot and it's not good enough, even if their photos are amazing, I get them to redo it. How do the pro photographers benefit from being on there, do you think? It's a bit of a corny word but exposure so you're you've come across Nikki Boone's work you wouldn't have otherwise yeah and uh, maybe you'll hire her in the future maybe you'll send her you know link to someone of your friends so there's that you know x thousand people visiting the site a day you're probably going to get you work in front of a few new eyeballs um, there's just the sense of community that you're helping out other photographers by showing them a little bit of behind the scenes so let's talk about the resources side because that is a that is a strong part of the site now. I don't have any kind of plan when I write, uh, no kind of editorial calendar or anything fancy where I know where I'm heading with all these posts usually. These were just things that I wrote that I thought this is really interesting to me and useful. Uh, so I just write on something that I thought would help someone else. Um, and yeah, the travel tips was one of them. Like I was doing a lot of destination weddings and finding that it was not all it was cracked up to be and you had to think of loads of things that uh, probably you wouldn't have to if you're just traveling with your family. Yeah, like the inside of my bag thing's great and all, but I don't think, you know, if you have come to the site a few times, then maybe you want to look for something else as well on there. So how do people um, contact you and get involved in, in the site? I know not everybody can because you've still got to, I mean, you're, you're a professional and there's a certain level that you've got to achieve to be on the site, or is that not true? It's a difficult one because I have my own taste of photography style, so I have to remove that subjectivity, but what I want is uh, a very nice um, gear shot, a well-written, well, just a piece that describes how they use the gear. I don't want people to be intimidated by the submission process, I guess, and also just being on the site. Yeah. Um, I know that one way they might be intimidated is seeing people we're using a lot of gear. Uh, I'm no advocate about using a minimal setup or a, lo a lot of gear, I'm not really, whatever works for you. Like I encourage everyone to try and send in their submission or just send me a link to your work. Like you don't have to go through the whole submission. Um, I don't like being the one saying, oh, your work's not good enough, but I, I, will, I would be able to say, oh, maybe, you know, there's a lot of other wedding photographers, for example, uh, give it a year or so or something. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that like, being that person, but if you want to submit, then yeah, go ahead. My thanks to Mark Condon for his walk around Darling Harbour and um, telling us all about Shot Kit. And of course, the best place to go if you want to see exactly what he was just talking about is all the W's, shotkit.com. It's competition time! This week, we have um, our first competition. We're going to be doing more of these, um, but I thought we'd start with something that uh, for wedding and portrait photographers, it's really important. I love the idea that we're beginning to see stuff on paper again. When I think the business went through a period where people just wanted digital product, didn't they? Yeah. Now it's coming back to albums again. And yeah. I mean that as well, not just because we're doing something here with QT albums. No. But no. I mean that because people are now showing an interest in albums. Yeah. I mean, how again. many, how many roughly do you think last year, how many of your clients had... Oh, a, th albums. a third maybe a third yeah which isn't enough but this year I feel it's going to be more because yeah. I've sold more album packages yeah I feel mine was higher than that I think mine was probably nearer 50% yeah um, maybe even higher but because I do the photo film element yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that affects album sales yeah you're far more cleverer than me well I don't know about that but um, <laughs> but certainly um, that, that affected that so this week we have uh, our first competition is with QT albums and you can see them by going to QT albums.com that's you, the you, letters q and t q, rather than oh yeah. c u t i e oh yeah not q t q t yeah no, q t q, q for quebec t for tango albums <laughs> Dot com. Kev, you can run through the detail. Uh, yeah, so QT Albums, I've known them for a very long time. They are uh, good friends of the wedding photography industry and uh, festivals such as the Snap Festival and various other things like that. For, uh, good guys. Um, 
and they have been gracious enough to give us a one of their new um, art book. They're calling it the art book journal art journal book. art book albums, which is really nice. We've seen it. It's uh, the one they've given us to get. Well, the one that we've got um, that we're looking at is an eight by eight journal art book. It's got a lovely kind of leather cover and you know all that good so stuff. It with kind it. of it's it kind of um, like the the original portfolios where you used to wrap leather around a book, yeah, and then tie it with a with a really cool tie. Yeah, it almost it almost yeah it, it almost looks like it's kind of it should have a like a. Um, uh, a seal on it, you know, a, a, a wax seal or something. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's beautiful. I really like it. Um, anyway, they are going to give one of you guys the opportunity to design your own a 10 spread 8x8 QT journal art book for free, totally for free, that you can use for yourself in the studio or you can use it for a client, whatever you so wish. And uh, before we give you the question, there is a question, of course, there has to be yeah, a question. Yeah. Um, you can, if you're unlucky enough not to win that uh, album, you, they have given us a coupon code which is FujiCast, believe it or not and that will give you 15% one time use of their um, their products uh, go to the QT Albums website for more information closing dates all that kind of stuff super um, so the question the question we, we have, have a question. photographic question uh, the question was on my screen and now it's gone no it's at the bottom of you uh, yeah. oh yeah look <laughs> you wrote that bit. We're, <laughs> we're getting good at this. <laughs> okay, so one of you, like I said, will get the uh, the ten spread eight by eight album from yep. QT Albums, and the question is: uh, Not only was Buzz Aldrin one of the first men on the moon, photographically, what was he famous for? Ooh, you may okay. need to go and do some research on this one. Send the emails to click at futurecasts.co.uk, and we can only accept this uh, little competition via that email. So any direct messages, comments on the website or Instagram all that other stuff uh, whilst you're we're more than happy for you to contact us in that way the competition has to be done via emails and all the results we will post on the website only www.fujicast.co.uk that's really important all the results will always be on the website www.fujicast.co.uk can I mention also reviews because they're really really precious to us aren't they Kev oh yes <laughs> reviews uh we were just talking about this off air and um you know we we're very conscious i think of uh, you know we're quite new to this podcast wise and we're quite conscious that we don't want to be uh you know we want to give you as much information as we can and talk to you and make it very friendly we don't want this to be like a sales pitch or anything however if you want us to carry on <laughs> <laughs> no uh, sort of Damocles or anything there. Then we really do need some uh, some online reviews for the podcast, uh, specifically in the o- Apple Podcast Network. That would be really cool. We've got lo- lots already. We're doing really well. Um, the feedback's been amazing. Um, the, the chart rankings have been very good. Everything's been brilliant um yep. i'm enjoying it uh neil i think is enjoying it yep. hopefully yep um and so if you can leave us a review online that would be great apple podcast reviews specifically um five stars all of that stuff be honest obviously <laughs> be honest but put five stars yes, in there. yes 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 right kit we're doing kit week it's kit week this week so um you go first with uh, with your 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 camera bag okay so um f- we're talking about weddings right mm. uh generally so my wedding camera bag that i would always take with me would have two x pro twos in it uh i actually have three x pro twos so one of them will be a backup so two x pro twos now i will also take my xt3 um because of I think we mentioned this before. I actually think the X-T3 is a far more capable camera than the X-Pro2, even though I prefer the X-Pro2 in terms of ergonomics and styling, etc. Uh, is it the styling the way the the X-Pro2 looks or no. because it doesn't doesn't feel and look like a big DSLR yeah. and the, the, so therefore you feel you can meld into the background more? Uh, yeah, it's honestly I the looks of a camera to me, like the aesthetic looks and how cool it looks, I, I mean nothing. I mean, I would be very happy if Fujifilm made a, a camera that you know looked like the end of my pen uh, you know as, if it did what it was meant to do yeah. that I'd be happy I'm not you know the the colours the, the retro look and everything whilst it's nice and I totally appreciate some people love that that's not why I buy the cameras you know um, and the X-Pro2 for me is ergonomically easier to use I prefer that smaller body that's the kind of rangefinder style um, but you know as with all good things in life there are options and that's why the X-T3 and that range exists too for people who prefer that style um, but the fact is the pure fact is the X-T3 
is a better photographically a better camera than the X Pro Two. Um, so if there was an X Pro Three, happy days. Absolutely, yeah. You know, for whatever, whenever, if ever that ever comes along, then almost mm. definitely, if it follows the same remit as before, then you know we're likely to see the same similar functionality in the, the current sensor in the next generation of X Pro cameras, mm. um, which. Yeah, that would be me. You used to carry an X100 as well, didn't you? Do you still do that? Yeah. I, it's worth, worth mentioning because it's their birthday. Do, 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 do. Eight years. Eight years. Since Eight the original X100. Yeah. to the day. Yeah. Um, now, actually, interestingly, I was I saw this um, this morning before I came over for on Fuji Rumours. So Fuji Rumours was said it's eight years today to since uh, the X100 was like launched, mm. and I thought that it was February. Um, he was right. Uh, Patrick, who runs the Fuji Rumours website, was absolutely right. I'm, he would never get anything like that wrong, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, today is uh, or actually yesterday. This was last night, so right. yesterday. <laughs> okay. By the is, time this one comes yeah, out. By yeah, by the time okay. this comes out. And if you're listening next year, it was last year. <laughs> yeah, happy ninth birthday. <laughs> and if you're listening two years' time, happy yeah. tenth birthday. Yeah, we could go through this. <laughs> yeah, so, listening, yes, go on. So eight years, X100, eight years old. And um, y- yeah, I mean, it has to be said that that's been the mainstay of my yeah. my camera love if you like and i will you know almost always take it with me it might be my reserve bag in the mm-hmm. car um or the x70 um but yeah the x100 x70 combination so in the bag there's generally three bodies in the two bag two x pro 2s one xt3 yeah right so this is my this is what i've been shooting with since the xt3 and came and the out. bag you use is uh, I've got multiple bags, but the one I'm using uh currently is the for weddings is the um David Allen Harvey. Oh, uh, that Filson one. It looks really Filson good. Bag. I like that one. Yeah, it's a Magnum branded Filson bag. It's a bit battered and bruised now. Um, but that's the way I like bags to mm. look. Yeah, it's very cool. I th- don't think they make them anymore, though. Um, oh. <laughs> sorry. Oh, there we go. But yeah, Filson, Filson bag. I'm not a big fan of kind of traditional wedding, uh, traditional camera bags that, no. you know. What do you mean, the rucksack type? Yeah, rucksacks. And also, yeah. and I don't want to be negative about any particular brand or anything. So, uh, you know, there there are there are camera bags that look like camera bags mm. and, you know, feel like camera bags and they have a price like camera bags. Mm. When actually, if you took the inserts out, it would just be any other bag and they could probably charge was 300 it, quid less. Jane Bowen, the um, news reporter from years ago, do you, do, do you know the name Jane, Jane Bowen? Ba- Bowen, the ba- photographer. Bowen. Ba- the photographer. Bowen, the photographer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What the, did I say then? Uh, Bowen. Bowen. Yeah. Ba- Bowen. Um, yeah, she was the um, observer photographer, wasn't she? That's she did right. those. She did the most amazing portraits. Jane Bowen. Yeah. 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 There we go. Jane Bowen, a life in photography. Yeah. English photographer who worked for the Observer newspaper yeah. from 1949. Mm. Her portraits, primarily photographed in black and white, used uh, available light, received widespread critical acclaim in the work has been described as kind of English Cartier-Bresson. That's yeah. that's um, that, that, that's coming from Wikipedia. I'm waiting to see how you're connecting this to my bag. Well, she used to use, apparently, um, plastic shopping bags. Oh, yeah. to, 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 no, I'm not suggesting you use plastic shopping bags. But, um, well, not, they cost five pence a go now. So. Well, she would be very disarming, I suppose, in that she'd wander in to go and see... Um, Prime Minister Thatcher with just a, a bag. <laughs> Thatcher uh, apparently li- liked her an awful lot, and she would wander in with just a bag, no great airs and graces. You were talking about bags looking like camera bags. Yeah, That's yeah, why yeah, I mentioned yeah, Jane, yeah. Yeah. because she, she would be the antithesis of that. I think, honestly, I, I'm glad you brought her up, really, because the, one of the first books I got was the um, A Life in Photography, I think it's called, something like that. Right. Um, and, yeah, I mean, totally amazing. I love her stuff. Uh, um, beautiful. Sadly, yeah. no longer with us. But yeah, nineteen four. Uh, sorry, two thousand fourteen. Yeah. She died, born nineteen twenty five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jane Bowen. Bowen. Yes. Um, so lens lenses. What do you use lens wise? Twenty three one point four. Yeah. Fifty six one point two. Yep. Um, they are. If I was to uh, look at my Lightroom catalog and do a dissection by lenses, they, that those two combinations would take up ninety percent yeah. easily. Um, the remainder would be something with X100, X70, perhaps a little spattering of 16 mil for for wider yeah. lens stuff. Yeah. Um, Nothing but wider it. than that? Not really. Because you have the 1024. I do. I did. You had it. Have you got... Oh, no, no, I've, I've got, got your battered and bruised uh, one. Yeah, You've got, got a brand new one, new one haven't you? Um, yes, I have. But I bought it for filming. I, I don't use it. I mean, it's F4 lens. It's not... 
yeah not fast really. enough i mean when i do the occasionally i've done really wider stuff um i would normally yeah i mean i, I just stick a wide angle conversion lens on the Okay. X70 or X100. And you're fine with that? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. I mean, lenses, obviously I have backup lenses and backup cameras mm. and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. It's Flash? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't use Flash, do you? You do have the little Manfrotto uh, Lumi Muse. I have the Manfrotto Lumi Muse. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the I have six, the six-lamp one. Six-lamp one, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is great, like really, really cool. Uh, it can you can sit it in the um, hot shoe if, if necessary, uh, or you can just hold it in your hand. Yeah. Camera in one hand, uh, light in the other. I've lost the uh, the gels that go on the front. I've lost the dimmer oh, thing. I'll give you, I've got one in my cupboard here. Uh, yeah. A spare one. Oh, cool. Hold on. I'm going to come on this show more often. This we go because I dropped this one. Huh. So I dropped my first Lumi Muse. There we go. Oh, Have some gels. Thanks. Yeah. Amazing what I keep in the cupboard down there. What else have you got in there? Well, I've, I've lost all of those as well. Last month's sandwiches. Oh, no, no. Change your mind. And I've got, I've got a, um, a 35 uh, mil F2 here, yeah. which I don't use. No. Anybody want that? <laughs> that could be a competition. Why have you got 53 written on the side? Well, because I always, for a long time, thought I was, I was thinking in 35 millimeter full frame uh, numbers. Okay. So it just helped me. It's like a golf bag. Go to the correct thing very quick. I don't uh, need it now because I know what 35 yeah, means. Yeah, I know yeah, what 23. Yeah. Three years and yeah. what 16, 16 years, but it's just a habit I got into. Yeah, so flash wise, that's it, nothing really. Uh, the Lumi Muse, um, and uh, yeah, I don't really honestly, the rest of my kit bag is is nothing else in it, really. Very just, little, just sandwiches, just junk, yeah, yeah, pens and chewing gums and stuff that you've not seen for years, a little bit of aftershave. And I'm very s- similar to you in terms of um, rather than go through the whole bag because lens wise pretty similar to be honest although mm. i do take the 10 to 24 around with me because i really like that when you're working i i work a lot in um, kitchens mm. during a during a wedding um obviously ex- explaining my felt like self mm. do you what you do they have to do washing up or something yeah yeah, yeah. kp mm. that's how i make the money <laughs> can't sell an album i'll be a kp for a day <laughs> no I, I i think that they make great images during the the wedding um i've always thought you know some people go off and they just spend two hours um, looking into the air or something, I've always thought, I'd, I'd like to go into the kitchen and, and follow what the chef's doing. Do you always get in? Do you, like, <clears throat> if this is a brand, let's just say on Saturday you're going to a brand new venue, you've never yep. been there before, yep. uh, what, do you, do you just go up to the wedding planner and say, can I go in the kitchen? Yeah, I usually, yes, essentially. I always go and say, um, I'd be really intrigued if I could photograph the, uh, the chef at work and make some cracking pictures. It's part of the day that the bride and groom will never see. It's an important part of the day because they, they spend so much on it. No. And, 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 and I would say if, if I've got any um, cracking pictures, they're usually black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm more than happy to, yeah. to let the chef and, and you use them. Yeah, because I've always seen these pictures on your website and stuff. And, and, and I, I don't know, I've never really... Uh, I've never really thought about it or never had the capacity to do it and and I always feel that they might it's just no say, different to working as a st- you've got to have more um, if you're talking in terms of having the courage to do it so it takes an awful lot more courage to go and do street photography no it's not so much the courage it's the I just have this impression that the chefs will just go no well, I have had them do that. All oh, right. yeah there was one guy I worked in a particular barn we've both worked at oh. and um, I asked the normal question uh, I asked it of the um, of the wedding coordinator on the day, and she took the request into the chef, who said, "No, you can go and tell him to f- off," hmm. um, which I thought was wasn't very friendly. Did you get food that evening? <clears throat> yeah, huh. yeah. Good. I sent it back. Said <laughs> recook it. It's cold. No, I didn't. <laughs> Never do that to no, a chef. No, 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 no. If we're lucky enough to get fed, anyway. never know what's yeah. going to come back. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, so I take the ten twenty four for that because I think that's quite good because there's there's hardly any room in in these kitchens usually, and I like to get round really low and get what mm. I call my classic nostril shot of I'm the uh, of the chef working. I'm going to try it. Uh, apart from that, yes, yeah, it's XT threes. Um, I don't have. Um, any other? Oh, no, I do have another Zoom. It's um, this one. That's not a Zoom. No, it's this one. It's the um, it's the 1855. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's image stabilised. We were talking about it earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, image yeah. stabilised. And I have that too. Which, yeah. I, which I use for when I do family portraits. Nice. And that's And that's about it, really. Um, yeah. Flash-wise, I do use the flash. I'm going to have to keep going back on the forwards here. 
Should have brought the bag over nearer. Um, it's the uh, V860. Uh, no, I had. The Godox. I, I do actually have that. Yeah. I had that because when you bought it, mm-hmm. I just I just wanted whatever you had, so I bought it as well. <laughs> um, but I've yet to actually. Take it out of the box? Yeah. No way. No, I've taken it out of the box, but I haven't really done much more with uh, other okay. with it. Yeah. All right. Well, I well, I use that. It's um, The only bit of Canon kit I now have is the, the lead that I run between the two, although I don't have to use it. I could use oh, that, a trigger. That old, what do they call it? OC8 lead? Uh, it? OC, whatever the lead is. And that, OC3. And that works per- perfectly. Uh, well, I, I can tell you it's in the bag. Does that work with that that godox thing then uh the godox yeah. yeah it's the canon off-camera shoe called oce3 or oh, good memory yeah yeah that's the lead i use well it's not that good memory because i called it an oc8 oh, and right. it's called an oce3 well, it's close, <laughs> close enough and then um obviously some recording sound recording equipment zoom f1 field recorders yeah. which um which i think why would a photographer want a field recorder but that's because I do these things called photo films, which, um, if you like, they're like, they're like slideshows on steroids, hmm. um, in that you get um, the sounds of the day alongside the stills of the day. And I like to record the speeches and um, and the service and stuff like that. And for that, I use I've got four packs of these Zoom F1 recorders. I was amazed the other day I was doing a wedding, and the video recorded um, only had one lavalier or lapel microphone set up, and um, I missed most of the speakers and uh, he looked into my bag and he said well what, what are you doing with those I thought well you should have them mate it's amazing the amount of videographers that don't think about sound in quite the same way yeah they look neat actually <clears throat> really good yeah yeah they've got a little clip on the back because yeah. the old H1s um, used to break used yeah that's to, why I've got the yeah. H1s yeah yeah so these are really good and they come complete with the microphone unit as well Do they, would you kind of put that down like if the bride is doing a speech well, what happens then? No, the bride's doing a speech. I tend to use an H1 and right. point it in her direction. Yeah, okay. Or um, there is this this little beastie here, which is the um, the Sony... Oh, I can't read. Sony Sony uh, IC Recorder hmm. TX650, which is really good, and that's quite small. You can slip that uh-huh. down at the top of a dress. <laughs> Sounds a bit suspect. It does. And uh, then there is another one. Look, in the magic drawer, you've got this. Um, which is the um, now this came out recently Instamic I- Instamic I it. love it Instamic In- what do you say Instamic or Instamic Mike because Mick is short for Mike microphone Instamic yeah. yeah I actually really like that yeah tiny it's like a horse pill <laughs> it is like a horse pill you're right and and you've got little magnets on the back uh-huh. and you can just uh-huh. clip it somewhere where people can't see and that that's great Insta and it's, mics. you can operate it all from your phone as well through the Absolutely, app which yeah. is really cool yeah what do you use first uh, w- with regard to cards memory cards um i use the sandisk extremes yep. um what well, the, the extreme pro this one the 300 yeah, me- megabit uh, well i have some of those i have the uhs2 ones which are the 300 megabytes per second ones but that's i also one, yeah. have the uh, vast majority of my cards are the standard uhs1 95 oh, okay. megabytes yeah. per second i always use sandisk extreme i never use any other brand um just purely because it's always worked never had any failures yep touch wood yeah yeah um yeah that's it um and in terms of the little pouch, I can see you're using one of those little camera... Little, uh, little think tank ones. Think tank pouches. Yeah, I use orin- the orange pouch for my photographic ones. Red means... Um, video. Video, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. I actually have a... Um, I have a... A, a low pro um, camera. It's, it's meant to be for a point and shoot, um, like... Yeah, cameras. By the way, we'll do the links to all these yeah, products. Yeah, yeah, we're kind of in the show notes. It's all getting a bit, bit, bit confusing, but it's it's meant to be for a little point and shoot camera to go in it. But it's got ah. two pockets inside, so I use that on my hip. I don't put a camera in it. I put my memory cards. So the ones on the outside pocket are the empty cards, and the ones on the inside pocket um, are there's two inside pockets. So the one on the front inside pocket is the memory cards that have the JPEGs on, and the one in the back inside pocket are the memory cards with the raw files on job done Uh so that's it we're all out of time for this week thank you very very much for listening Um, in a kind of cute angle um, the payoffs this week are being done by the kidlings the kidlings as as Kev says who's doing your payoff Uh, Rosa I think ah 
My dad's Instagram is Kevin Mullins Photography. See his films on YouTube at Documentary Eye. His website is kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk. Or for street workshops, training and everything Fujifilm, go to f16.click. Ah, oh, mine's going to be done by my little Thomas. My dad's Instagram is Neil James. See his films on YouTube at Neil James Photo. His website is neiljames.com for pictures and one-to-one mentoring. And you can hear his other photography podcast, which is called Breathe Pictures, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh. Oh, and don't forget his name is spelled N-E-A-L-E. Bless them He both. needs to give Rosa a lesson. <laughs> yeah, he does. Bless he, him. Yeah. Well, look, he sits in here and plays radio, so... Uh comes down to the studio sits in says can I play radio oh bless so him there we go yeah so thank you very much for, for listening this week um, we'll, we'll have stuff on the show uh, in the show notes about all the bits we've talked about can I just quickly say as well if you want to do some mentoring with myself and Kev then we're going to be mentioning that next week in the show and next week's going to be all about weddings isn't it it is indeed lots of weddings got some interesting stories both of us and uh, <laughs> don't forget <laughs> to keep sending in your questions click yes. at futurecast.co.uk lifeblood of the show thank you bye bye